Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales with myself, Rory, from Varietal Literature. If you've never been here before, well, this is a place where we have fun with narrative, and sometimes that's writing our own stuff, and sometimes that's um, more along the lines of today, where we're reading a story together. Uh, let me know if you can hear me in the chat if you're watching this live. If you are not watching this live, you should know that down in the description, usually by the next day, there's little timestamps for when the stories start. So if you're just here for the stories, feel free to click on one of the timestamps in whatever story you prefer. And that would be the best way for you probably to absorb it. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday. Just checking some things here. And, um... Okay. Good evening, GS. Um, I hope you all had a wonderful holiday, uh, or at least enjoyed it to some extent. I know that for some people the holidays can be very difficult. So, um, on that vein, I will say that my theme this month, not so much specifically here, but just anywhere where I'm streaming, is uh, sort of uh, the month of anti-depression. <laughs> Um, because this Jan, if you don't know, January and February are considered, especially January, uh, was some of the bleakest months to get through. And so to help with that, I hope that I will be able to, well, I hope that I'll be able to help with that, uh, by how we do things. So the other stream that we do is on Thursdays at 6.30, which is where we write stuff. And I'm going to be focusing on stuff that has made me happy, or at least taken me away from cold awful reality when I needed to get away from it because it was cold and awful okay well that's probably enough blabbing about general channel stuff I hope you enjoyed the content over the winter break obviously it's a little different uh, the comedy video did a lot better than I expected so I will probably do a little more in that vein and I also have some new equipment so uh, that gives me that I got through Christmas which I'm very excited about and it gives me options to do different content. Hopefully it'll be stuff that you guys enjoy. Now, what are we doing today? We're doing Scottish 
fairy book. The Scottish fairy book. We've read something from here before called the Dwarfy Stone, which again was based on a real uh, location, an object in Scotland called the Dwarfy Stone, <clears throat> which is sort of um, a kind of hut made out of stones, like a tomb. Um, and uh, it was... We sort of observed when we read this last that they are more, a little more adult in nature. And I don't mean like they're more salacious or they're more violent or whatever, because all fairy tales are violent, weird, and kind of borderline too sexual for what they are. Um, no, what I mean more so is uh, they are adult in the sense that they have a far more developed sense of narrative and story. And I think we're gonna see that today. Uh, the first story that we're going to read, which I will get us to here, <clears throat> is actually one of my favorite I've ever read. It's of a real guy. I mean, you'll have to make your own decisions about how real the story is of him, but it's of a real guy named Thomas the Rhymer, who lived in uh, 13th century Scotland. He was a lord of um, a castle in Ber Berkshire, Berwickshire, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and um, yeah, it, this is sort of a, a mythological tale wrapped around him and some of the things he was known for. The main thing he was known for was speaking in rhyme, which he really doesn't do here. So it's very strange. <laughs> that the story doesn't... I mean, it does address it, but it's strange that the story doesn't actually capitalize on that. All right. So, with that said, uh, our first story comes from Scottish Fairy Book. Uh, it is Thomas the Rhymer. And hopefully you enjoy it. Of all the young gallants in Scotland in the 13th century, there was none more gracious and debonair than Thomas Learmont, lord of the castle of Ursuldone in Berwickshire. He loved books, poetry, and music, which were uncommon tastes in those days, and above all, he loved to study nature and to watch the habits of the beasts and birds that made their abode in the fields and woods around his home. Now it chanced that one sunny May morning, Thomas left his tower of Ursuldown and went wandering into the woods that lay about the Huntley Burn, a little stream that came rushing down from the slopes of the Ayaldon Hills. It was a lovely morning, fresh and bright and warm, and everything was so beautiful that it looked as paradise might look. The tender leaves were bursting out of their sheaths and the covering all the trees with a fresh soft mantle of green. And amongst the carpet of moss under the young man's feet, Yellow primroses and starry anemones were turning up their faces to the morning sky. The little birds were singing like to burst their throats, and hundreds of insects were flying backwards and forwards in the sunshine. While down by the burn side, the bright-eyed water rats were poking their noses out of their holes as if they knew that summer had come and wanted to have a share in all that was going on. Thomas felt so happy with the gladness of it all that he threw himself down at the root of a tree to watch the living things around him. As he was lying there, he heard the trampling of a horse's hooves as it forced its way through the bushes and looking up, he saw the most beautiful lady that he'd ever seen come riding towards him on a gray palfrey, which is a horse. She wore a hunting dress of glistening silk the color of the fresh spring grass, and from her shoulders hung a velvet mantle while watching the riding skirt exactly, which matched the riding skirt exactly. Her yellow hair, like rippling gold, hung loosely around her shoulders, and on her head sparkled a diadem of precious stones, which flashed like fire in the sunlight. Her saddle was of pure ivory, and her saddle cloth of blood-red satin, while her saddle girths were of corded silk and her stirrups of cut crystal, her horse reins were of beaten gold, all hung with little silver bells, so that she rode along, as she rode along, she made sound like fairy music. 
Apparently, she was bent on the chase, for she carried a hunting horn and a sheaf of arrows, and she led seven greyhounds along in a leash, while as many scenting hounds ran loose at her horse's side. As she rode toward the glen, she lilted a bit of an old Scotch song, and she carried herself with such a queenly air, and her dress was so magnificent that Thomas was like to kneel by the side of the path and worship her, for he thought that it must be the Blessed Virgin herself. But when the rider came to where he was and understood his thoughts, she shook her head sadly. I am not the blessed lady, as thou thinkest, she said. Men call me queen, but it is of a far other country. For I am the queen of fairyland, and not the queen of heaven. And certainly it seemed as if what she said were true, for from that moment it was as if a spell was cast over Thomas, making him forget prudence and caution and common sense itself. For he knew that it was dangerous for mortals to meddle with fairies, yet he was so entranced with the lady's beauty that he begged her to give him a kiss. This was just what she wanted, for she knew that if she once kissed him, she had him in her power. And to the young man's horror, as soon as their lips had met, an awful change came over her. For her beautiful mantle and riding skirt of silk seemed to fade away, leaving her clad in a long gray garment which was just the color of ashes. Her beauty seemed to fade away also. She grew old and wan, and worst of all, half of her abundant yellow hair went gray before his very eyes. She saw the poor man's astonishment and terror, and she burst into a mocking laugh. I am not so fair to look on now as I was at first, she said, but that matters little, for thou hast sold thyself, Thomas, to be my servant for seven long years. For whoso kisseth the fairy queen must e'en go on with her to fairyland, and serve her there till the time is past. When he heard these words, poor Thomas fell on his knees and begged for mercy, but mercy he could not obtain. The elfin queen only laughed in his face and brought her dapple gray palfrey close up to where he was standing. No, no, she said in answer to his entreaties. Thou didst ask the kiss, and now thou must pay the price. So dally no longer, but mount behind me, for it is full time that I was gone. So Thomas, with many a sigh and a groan of terror, mounted behind her. And as soon as he had done so, she shook her bridle rein, and the gray steed galloped off. On and on they went, going swifter than the wind, till they left the land of the living behind, and came to the edge of a great desert, which stretched before them dry and bare and desolate, to the edge of the far horizon. At least it seemed to the weary eyes of Thomas of Ursuldown, and he wondered if he and his strange companion had to cross this desert, and if so, if there were any chance of reaching the other side of it alive. But the fairy queen suddenly tightened her reins, and the gray palfrey stopped short in its wild career. Now thou descend on earth, Thomas, said the lady, glancing over her shoulder to her unhappy captive, and lout down, and lay thy head on my knee, I and I will show thee hidden things which cannot be seen by mortal eyes. So Thomas dismounted and louted down, and rested his eyes on the fairy queen's knee, and lo, as he looked once more over the desert, everything seemed to change. For he saw three roads leading across it now, which he had not noticed before, and each of these three roads was different. One of them was broad and level and even, and it ran straight on across the sand, so that no one who was traveling by it could possibly lose his way. The second road was as different from the first as it well could be. It was narrow and winding and long, and there were, was a thorn hedge on one side of it and a briar hedge on the other. 
and those hedges grew so high and their branches were so wild and tangled that those who were traveling along that road would have some difficulty in persevering their journey at all. And the third road was unlike any of the others. It was a bonny bonny road, winding up a hillside among brackens and heather and golden yellow winds, and it looked as if it would be pleasant traveling to pass that way. Now, said the fairy queen, and thou wilt, I shall tell thee where these three roads lead to. The first road, as thou seest, is broad and even as easy, and there may be many that choose it to travel on. But though it be a good road, it leadeth to a bad end, and the folk that choose it repent their choice forever. And as for the narrow road, all hampered and hindered by the thorns and the briars, there be few that be troubled to ask where that leadeth to. But did they ask, perchance, more of them might be stirred up to set out along it? For did, for that is the road of righteousness. And although it be, it might be hard and irksome, yet it endeth in a glorious city, which is called the city of the great king. And the third road, the bonny road, that runs up the brail among the ferns, and leadeth no mortal kens whither. Ken, by the way, is a Scottish word for no ken something is to know it no mortal kens whether but i ken where it leadeth thomas for it leadeth unto fair elf land and that road take we and mark ye thomas if ever thou hopest to see thy own tower of ursel down again take care of thy tongue when we reach our journey's end and speak no single word to anyone save me for the mortal who open his lips rashly in fairyland must bide there forever. Then she bade him mount her palfrey again, and they rode on. The ferny road was not so bonny all the way as it had been at first, however, for they had not ridden along it very far before it led them into a narrow ravine which seemed to go right down under the earth, and there was no ray of light to guide them, and where the air was dank and heavy, there was a sound of rushing water everywhere, and at last the grey palfrey plunged right into it and crept up, cold and chill, first over Thomas's feet and then over his knees. Pardon me. His courage had been slowly ebbing ever since he had been parted from the daylight, and now he gave himself up for the lost. For it seemed to him certain that his strange companion and he would never come safe to their journey's end. He fell forward in a kind of swoon. And if it had not been that he had tight hold of the fairy's ash gray ground, gown, uh, I warrant he had fallen from his seat and had been drowned. But all things, be they good or bad, pass in time, and at last the darkness began to lighten, and the light grew stronger until they were back in the broad sunshine. Then Thomas took courage and looked up, and lo, they were riding through a beautiful orchard where apples and pears and dates and figs and wine berries grew in great abundance. And his tongue was so parched and dry, he felt so faint that he longed for some of the fruit to restore him. He stretched out his hand to pluck some of it, but his companion turned in her saddle and forbade him. There is nothing safe for thee to eat here, she said, save an apple, which I will give thee presently. If thou touch aught else, thou art bound to remain in fairyland forever. So poor Thomas had to restrain himself as best he could. And they rode slowly on until they came to a tiny tree all covered with little red apples. The fairy queen bent down and plucked one and handed it to her companion. This I can give thee, she said, and I do it gladly, for these apples are the apples of truth. And whoso eateth them gaineth this reward, that his lips will never more be able to frame a lie. Thus Thomas took the apple and ate it, and forevermore the grace of truth rested on his lips, and that is why, in after years, men called him True Thomas. 
They had only a little way to go after this before they came in sight of a magnificent candle can, castle standing on a hillside. Yonder is my abode, said the queen, pointing to it proudly. There dwelleth my lord and all the nobles of his court, and as my lord hath an uncertain temper and shows no liking for any strange gallant whom he sees in my company, I pray thee, both for thy sake and mine, to utter no word to any one who speaketh to thee. And if any one should ask me who and what thou art, I will tell them that thou art dumb. So wilt thou pass unnoticed in the crowd? I gotta be honest, it sounds like more of a hassle than a help for fairies to carry people along. With these words, the lady raised her hunting horn and blew a loud and piercing blast. And as she did so, a marvelous change came over her again, for her ugly ash-covered gown dropped off her, and the gray in her hair vanished, and she appeared once more in her green riding skirt and mantle, and her face grew young and fair. And a wonderful change passed over Thomas also, for, as he chanced to glance downwards, he found that his rough country clothes had been transformed into a suit of fine brown cloth, and that on his feet he wore satin shoon. Immediately the sound of the horn rang out, the doors of the castle flew open, and the king hurried out to meet the queen. Accompanied by such a number of knights and ladies, minstrels and page boys, that Thomas, who had slid from his palfrey, had no difficulty in obeying her wishes and passing into the castle unobserved. Everyone seemed very glad to see the queen back again, and they crowded into the great hall in her train, and she spoke to them all graciously and allowed them to kiss her hand. Then she passed with her husband to a dais at the far end of the huge apartment where two thrones stood on which the royal pair seated themselves to watch the revels which now began. Poor Thomas Mainwell stood far away at the other end of the hall, feeling very lonely, yet fascinated by the extraordinary scene on which he was gazing. For although the all the fine ladies and courtiers and knights were dancing in one part of the hall. They were huntsmen coming and going in another part, carrying in great antler deer, which apparently they had killed in the chase and throwing them down in heaps on the floor. And there were rows of cooks standing beside the dead animals, cutting them up into joints and bearing away the joints to be cooked. Altogether, it was a strange, fantastic scene that Thomas took no heed of how the time flew, but stood and gazed and gazed, never speaking a word to anybody. This went on for three long days. Then the queen rose from her throne and, stepping from the dais, crossed the hall to where he was standing. "'Tis mountain ride, Thomas,' she, she said, if thou wouldst ever see the fair castle of Ursuldown again. Thomas looked at her in amazement. Thou spokest of seven long years, lady, he exclaimed. I have been here but three days. Sorry. The queen smiled. Time passes quickly in fairyland, my dear friend, she replied. Thou thinkest that thou hast been here but three days. Tis seven years since we two met. And now it is time for thee to go. I would fain have had thy presence with me longer, but I dare not for thine own sake. For every seventh year an evil spirit cometh from the regions of darkness, and carrieth back with him one of our followers, whomsoever he chanceth to choose. And as thou art a goodly fellow, I fear that he might choose thee. So as I would be loth to let harm befall thee, I will take thee back to thine own country this very night. Once more the grey palfrey was brought, and Thomas and the queen mounted it, and as they had come so they returned to the Ildon tree near the Huntley Burn. Then the queen bade Thomas farewell, and as a parting gift he asked her to give him something that would let people know that he'd really been to fairyland. I've already given thee the gift of truth, she replied. I will now give thee the gifts of prophecy and poesy. 
so that thou wilt be able to foretell the future and also to write wondrous verses. And besides these unseen gifts, here is something that mortals can see with their own eyes, a harp that was fashioned in fairyland. Fare thee well, my friend. Some day, perchance, I will return for thee again. With these words, the lady vanished, and Thomas left alone, feeling a little sorry if the truth must be told at parting with such a radiant being and coming back to the ordinary haunts of men. After this, he lived for many a long year in his castle of Ursuldown, and the fame of his poetry and the prophecies spread all over the country, so that people named him True Thomas and Thomas the Rhymer. I cannot write down for you all the prophecies which Thomas uttered and which most certainly came to pass, but I will tell you one or two. He foretold the Battle of Bannockburn in these words, The burn of braid shall rin foul raid. In other words, um, the place where braid is shall um, have a foul raid. Which came to pass on that terrible day when the waters of the little Bannockburn were reddened by the blood of the defeated English. He also foretold the union of the crowns of England and Scotland under a prince who was the son of a French queen and who yet bore the blood of Bruce in his veins. A French queen shall bear the sun, shall rule all Britain to the sea, as near as is the ninth degree, which came true in 1603 when King James, son of Mary, Queen of Scots, became monarch of both counties, countries, sorry. Fourteen long years went by, and people were beginning to forget that Thomas the Rhymer had ever been in Fairyland. But alas, a day came when Scotland was at war with England, and the Scottish army was resting by the banks of the Tweed, not far from the Tower of Ursuldown. Such a pretty picture. And the master of the tower determined to make a feast, and invited all the nobles and barons who were leading the army to sup with him. Their feast was long remembered. For the Lord of Ursuldown took care that everything was as mag magnificent as it could possibly be. When the meal was ended, he rose in his place, and taking his elfin harp, he sang to his assembled guests song after song of the days long ago. The guests listened breathlessly, for they felt they would never hear such wonderful music again, and so it fell out. For that very night, after all the nobles had gone back to their tents, a soldier on guard saw, in the moonlight, a snow-white heart and hind moving slowly down the road that ran past the camp. Heart and hind are um, male and female deer. <clears throat> Heard me? There was something so unusual about the animals that he called to his officer to come and take a look at them. And the officer called to his brother officers, and soon there was quite a crowd softly following the dumb creatures, who paced solemnly on as if they were keeping time to music unheard by mortal ears. There is something uncanny about this, said one soldier at last. Let us send for Thomas of Ursuldown. Perchance he may be able to tell us if it be an omen or no. I send for Thomas of Ursuldown, cried everyone at once. So a little page was sent in haste to the old tower to rouse the rhymer from his slumbers. When he heard the boy's message, the seer's face grew grave and rapt. Tis a summons, he said softly. A summons from the Queen of Fairyland. I have waited long for it, and it hath come at last. And when he went out, instead of joining the little company of waiting men, he walked straight up to the snow-white heart and hind. As soon as he reached them, they paused for a moment as if to greet him. Then all three moved slowly down a steep bank that sloped to the little river leader and disappeared in its foaming waters, for the stream was in full flood. And although a careful search was made, no trace of Thomas of Ursuldown was found. And to this day, the country folk believe that Hart and Hind were messengers from the Elfin Queen, and that he went back to Fairyland with them.
And that's the story of Thomas the Rhymer, who again was a real guy, a lord of Urseldown in Scotland, um, in Birkenworth. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the rest of it, you'll have to decide if you, uh, how much of it you believe. GS says, oh goodness, he can't speak for seven years. Well, yeah, but as it turns out, only three days. Apples too? This is worse than an after Christmas diet. Yeah. I can think of things I wouldn't mind eating for seven years. Apples aren't them. What about you guys? What would you eat for seven years if you had to? If you got dragged off to fairyland, what food would you eat for seven years? I think we can assume nutrition isn't a huge problem here because, like, for three days he seemed to be fine on an apple. <coughs> Oh, I see. We have the blessings of spam with us again. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. Hello, Russian spam message. Go away. Yes, says, what a beautiful story. Um, yeah, I actually, I really, really was very charmed by that story. Hopefully others uh, enjoyed it. Oh yeah, actually, I think that's just the next story that we're reading, honestly. Um, I think what I enjoy about it is it's really not, when you reflect on it, it's not too clear what exactly it is. Like, it's very much a legend in that it's not clearly a story about anything, really. It's just, he goes to this fairyland and he describes it. He gets some gifts and then he goes back. It does have obvious, um, it does have obvious allusions to uh, biblical content, but I don't know why. Like, I, I don't know, like, I do know that obviously Christianity had a huge influence. What I mean is, um, I don't really know what it's trying to say. Obviously, three days is important in Christianity. And, um, you know, the idea of there's that kind of, I think it's Moses who just wanders up to a hill and gets carried off to heaven. Like, there's lots of imagery. He confuses the elf and queen for Mother Mary. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of nods to Christianity in it. Yeah, GS says, but it is enchanting. Yeah, and I guess ultimately, you know, if you're going to read a legend or you're going to tell a tale, that's kind of the point. Okay. So, this wonderful picture here of people in a boat traversing water relates to our next story. Oh, gold tree and silver tree which I think you will be interested in because it has a very familiar storyline but with a uh, distinct enough changes in it that it's obviously influenced by a common thread but different it's it's a standalone story for sure but it is also very clear well uh, you'll see I think you'll pick up right away what rather famous fairy tale this is a version of. We can do another button up there. It's winter. I don't want to be heating too many people up. <clears throat> oh, come on. <laughs> How did the people of the... This is like a traditional sort of Irish peasant shirt. And uh, my God, how do they deal with these buttons? Okay, so this is Gold and Silver Tree, which has a very obvious common root to one of the most famous fairy tales, but it takes a very different approach to it. In bygone days, there lived a little princess named Golden Tree, Gold Tree, sorry, and she was one of the prettiest children in the whole world. Although her mother was dead, she had a very happy life, for her father loved her dearly and thought that nothing was too much trouble so long as it gave her little daughter pleasure, his little daughter pleasure. But by and by he married again, and then the little prison princess's sorrows began. For his new wife, whose name, curious to say, was Silvertree, 
was very beautiful, but she was also very jealous. And she made herself quite miserable for fear that someday she should meet someone who was better looking than herself. When she found that her stepdaughter was so very pretty, she took a dislike to her at once. She was always looking at her and wondering if people would think her prettier than she was. And because in her heart of hearts she was afraid that they would do so, she was very unkind indeed to the poor girl. At last, one day, when Princess Goldtree was quite grown up, the two ladies went for a walk to a little well which lay all surrounded by trees in the middle of a deep glen. Now, the water in this well was so clear that everyone who looked into it saw his face reflected on the surface. And the proud queen loved to come and peep into its depths so that she could see her own picture mirrored in the water. But today, as she was looking in, what should she see but a little trout, which was swimming quietly backwards and forwards, not very far from the surface. Trouty, Trouty, answer me this one question, said the queen. Am I not the most beautiful woman in the world? No, indeed you are not, replied the trout promptly, jumping out of the water as he spoke in order to swallow a fly. Who is the most beautiful woman then? asked the disappointed queen, for she had expected a far different answer. Thy stepdaughter, the princess Goldtree, without a doubt, said the little fish. Then, frightened by the black look that came upon the jealous queen's face, he dived to the bottom of the well. It was no wonder that he did so, for the queen's expression was not pleasant to look at, as she darted an angry glance at her fair young stepdaughter, who was busy picking flowers some little distance away. Indeed, she was so annoyed at the thought that anyone should say that the girl was prettier than she was, that she quite lost her self-control, and when she reached home, she went up in a violent passion to her room and threw herself on the bed, declaring that she felt very ill indeed. God, I feel like I've met this woman. It was in vain that Princess Goldtree asked her what the matter was, and if she could do anything for her. She would not let the poor girl touch her, but pushed her away as if she had done some evil thing. So at last the princess had to leave her alone and go out of the apartment, feeling very sad indeed. By and by the king came home from his hunting, and he at once asked for the queen. Sorry. He was told that she had been seized with sudden illness, and that she was lying on her bed in her own room. That no one, not even the court physician who had been hastily summoned, <clears throat> could make out what was wrong with her. In great anxiety, for he really loved her, the king went up to her bedside and asked how the queen, how she felt, and if there was anything he could do to relieve her. Yes, there is one thing that thou couldst do, she answered harshly, but I know full well that even though it is the only thing that will cure me, thou wilt not do it. Nay, said the king, I deserve better words at thy mouth than these, for thou knowest that I would give thee aught thou carest to ask, even if it be half of my kingdom. Then give me thy daughter's heart to eat, cried the queen, for unless I can obtain that, I will die, and speedily. She spoke so wildly and looked at him in such strange fashion that the poor king really thought her brain was turned, and he was at his wit's end what to do. He left the room and paced up and down the corridor in great distress, until at last he remembered that the very morning the son of a great king had arrived from a country far over the sea, asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. Get ready for a lot of convenience in this story, by the way. Here is a way out of the difficulty, he said to himself. This marriage pleaseth me well, and I will have it celebrated at once. Then, when my daughter's safe out of the country, I'll send a lad up the hillside, and he shall kill a he-goat. And I will have its heart prepared and dressed, and send it up to my wife. Perhaps the sight of it will cure her of this madness. 
so he had the strange prince summoned before him, and told him how the queen had taken a sudden illness that had wrought on her brain, and it caused her to take a dislike to the princess. And how it seemed as if it would be a good thing if, with the maiden's consent, the marriage could take place at once, so that the queen might be left alone to recover from her strange malady. Now, the prince was delighted to gain his bride so easily, and the princess was glad to escape from her stepmother's hatred. So the marriage took place at once, and the newly wedded pair set off across the sea for the prince's country. Then the prince sent a lad up the hillside to kill a he-goat. And when it was killed, he gave orders that its heart should be dressed and cooked, and he sent to the queen's apartment on a silver dish. And the wicked woman tasted it, believing it to be the heart of her stepdaughter. And when she had done so, she rose from her bed and went about the castle looking as well and as hearty as ever. I am glad to be able to tell you that the marriage of Princess Goldtree, which had come about in such a hurry, turned out to be a great success. For the princess whom she had wedded was rich, for the prince whom she had wedded was rich and great and powerful, and he loved her dearly, and she was as happy as the day it was long. So things went peacefully on for a year. Queen Silver Tree was satisfied and contented because she thought that her stepdaughter was dead. Well, all the time the princess was happy and prosperous in her new home. But at the end of the year, it chanced that the queen went once more to the well in the little glen in order to see her face reflected in the water. But at the end of the year, oh, sorry, and it chanced also that the same little trout was swimming backwards and forwards just as he had done the year before. And the foolish queen determined to have a better answer to her question this time than she did last. Trouty, trouty, she whispered, leaning over the edge of the well. Am I not the most beautiful woman in the world? By my troth, thou art not, answered the trout in his very straightforward way. Who is the most beautiful woman then, asked the queen, her face growing pale. <clears throat> At the thought that she had yet another rival. Why, your majesty's stepdaughter. The Princess Gold Tree, to be sure, answered the trout. The queen threw back her head with a sigh of relief. Well, at any rate, for people cannot admire her now, she said, for it is a year since she died. I ate her heart for supper. Art thou sure of that, Majesty? asked the trout, with a twinkle in his eye. Methinks it is but a year since she married the gallant young prince, who came from abroad to seek her hand and returned <clears throat> with him to his own country. Sorry. When the queen heard these words, she turned quite cold with rage, for she knew that her husband had deceived her. And she rose from her knees and went straight home to the palace and, hiding her anger as best she could, she asked him if he would give orders to have the long ship made ready as she wished to go and visit her dear stepdaughter, for it was such a very long time since she had seen her. I don't know, by the way, why the king is a complete idiot in this, but he is. The king was somewhat surprised at her request. But he was only too glad to think that she had gotten over her hatred towards his daughter. And he gave orders that the longship should be made ready at once. Soon it was speeding over the water, its prow turned in the direction of the land where the princess lived, steered by the queen herself. For she knew the course that the boat ought to take. And she was in such haste to be her journey's end that she would allow no one else to take the helm. Now it chanced that Princess Goldtree was alone that day, for her husband had gone a-hunting. And as she looked out one of the castle windows, she saw a boat coming, sailing over the sea towards the landing place. She recognized it as her father's longship, and she guessed only too well whom it carried on board. She was almost beside herself with terror at the thought. 
for she knew that it was for no good purpose that Queen Silvertree had taken the trouble to set out to visit her. And she felt that she would give given almost anything she possessed if her husband had been but at home. In her distress, she hurried into the servant's hall. Oh, what shall I do? Oh, what shall I do? She cried, for I see my father's longship coming over the sea, and I know that my stepmother is on board, and if she hath a chance, she will kill me, for she hateth me more than anything else upon earth. Now, the servants worshipped the ground that their young mistress trod on, for she was always kind and considerate to them. And when they saw how frightened she was and heard her piteous words, they crowded round her, as if to shield her from any harm that threatened her. Don't be afraid, your highness, they cried. We will defend thee with our very lives if need be. But in case thy lady stepmother should have the power to throw an evil spell over thee, we will lock thee in a great Molinid chamber. Then she can't get nigh thee at all. Now, the Molinid Mollyand, sorry, the Mollyand chamber, that's what I meant to say, was a strong room which was in a part of the castle all by itself, and its door was so thick that no one could possibly break through it. The princess knew that if she were once inside the room, with its stout oaken door between her and her stepmother, she would be perfectly safe from any mischief that wicked woman could devise. So she consented to her faithful servant's suggestions and allowed them to lock her in the mullioned chamber. So it came to pass that when Queen Silvertree arrived at the great door of the castle and commanded the lackey who opened it to take her to his royal mistress, he told her, with a low bow, that that was impossible, because the princess was locked in the strong room of the castle and could not get out, because no one knew where the key was. Which was quite true. For the old butler had tied it around the neck of the prince's favorite sheepdog and sent him away to the hills to seek his master. Take me to the door of the apartment, commanded the queen. At least I can speak to my dear daughter through it. And the lackey who did not see the harm could possibly come from this did as he was bid. If the key is really lost, and thou canst not come out to welcome me, dear gold tree, said the deceitful queen, at least put thy little finger through the keyhole so that I may kiss it. The princess did so, never dreaming that evil could come to her through such a simple action, but it did. For instead of kissing the tiny finger, her stepmother stabbed it with a poison needle, and so deadly was the poison that before she could under a single cry, the poor princess fell, as one dead, on the floor. When she heard the fall, a smile of satisfaction crept over Queen Silvertree's face. Now I can say that I am the handsomest woman in the world, she whispered. And she went back to the lackey who stood waiting at the end of the passage and told him that she had said all that she had to say to her daughter and now that she must return home. So the man attended her to the boat with all due ceremony and she set sail for her own country. And no one in the castle knew that any harm had befallen their dear mistress until the prince came home from his hunting with the key of the mullioned chamber, sorry which he had taken from his sheepdog's neck in his hand. Oh, there's the bed. Tell me if you've figured out what this is clearly a version of. What story? He laughed when he heard the story of Queen Silvertree's visit. He told the servants that they had done well, and then he ran upstairs to open the door and release his wife. But what was his horror and dismay? when he did so to find her lying dead at the feet at his feet on the floor he was nearly beside himself with rage and grief because he knew that a deadly poison such as queen silver tree had used would preserve the princess's body so that it had no need of burial he had laid it on a silken couch and left in the mullion chamber so that he could go and look at it whenever he pleased he was so terribly lonely, however, that in little time he married again. His second wife was just as sweet and as good as the first had been. 
This new wife was very happy. There was only one little thing that caused her any trouble at all. She was too sensible to let it make her miserable. The one thing was there that was there was one room in the castle, a room which stood at the end of a passage by itself, which she could never enter, as her husband always carried the key. And as when she asked him the reason of this, he always made up excuses of some kind. She made up her mind that she would not seem as if she did not trust him, and so she asked no more questions about the manor. But one day, the prince chanced to leave the door unlocked, and as he had never told her not to do so, she went in. And there she saw Princess Goldtree lying on the silken couch, looking as if she were asleep. Is she dead? Or is she only sleeping? She said to herself. And she went up to the couch and looked closely at the princess. And there, sticking in her little finger, she discovered a curiously shaped needle. There hath been evil work here, she thought to herself. If that needle be not poisoned, then I know not of medicine. And being skilled in leechcraft, she drew it out carefully out. In a moment, Princess Goldtree opened her eyes and sat up. And presently she had recovered sufficiently to tell the other princess the whole story. Now, if her stepmother had been jealous, the other princess was not jealous at all. For when she heard all that had happened, she clapped her little hands, crying, Oh, how glad the princess will be! For although he married again, I know that he loves thee best. That night the prince came home from hunting, looking very tired and sad. For what his second wife had said was quite true. Although he loved her very much, he was always mourning in his heart for his first dear love, Princess Goldtree. How sad that art, thou art, exclaimed his wife, going out to meet him. Is there nothing I can do to bring a smile to thy face? Nothing, answered the prince wearily, laying down his bow, for he was too heart-sore to even pretend to be gay. Except to give thee back gold tree, said his wife mischievously. And that I can do. Thou wilt find her alive and well in the Molyneux chamber. Molyneux chamber, my God. Without a word, the prince ran upstairs and sure enough, there was his dear gold tree sitting on the couch ready to welcome him. He was so overjoyed to see her that he threw his arms around her neck and kissed her over and over and again, quite forgetting his poor second wife who had followed him upstairs and who now stood watching the meeting that she had brought. Poor lady. <laughs> ah, GS got it. Says, I prefer this version to Sleeping Beauty. I gotta be honest, I kinda do too. It, it has its weirdness and more weirdness to come but it frankly makes more sense <clears throat> she did not seem to be sorry for herself however I always knew that thy heart yearned after princess Goldtree, she said and it is but right that it should be so for she was thy first love and she hath come to life again I will go back to mine own people no, indeed thou wilt not, answered the prince, for it is thou who hast brought me this joy. Thou wilt stay with us, and we shall all three live happily together, and Gold Tree and thee will become great friends. Presumptuous. Also, thinking in this era might not have been that weird. And so it came to pass. For Princess Goldtree and the other princess soon became like sisters, and loved each other as if they had been brought up together all their lives. In this manner, another year passed, and one evening in the old country, Queen Silvertree went, as she had done before, to look at her face in the water of the little well in the glen. And as happened twice before, the trout was there. Trouty, trouty, she whispered, am I not the most beautiful woman in the world? By my troth, thou art not, answered the trout as he had answered on the two previous occasions. And who dost thou say is the most beautiful woman now? asked the queen, her voice trembling with rage and vexation. I've given her name to thee these two years back, answered the trout. The princess Goldtree, of course. But she is dead. 
laughed the queen. I am sure of it, for it is just a year since I stabbed her little finger with a poisoned needle, and I heard her fall down dead on the floor. I'd not be so sure of that, answered the trout, and without saying another word, he dived straight down to the bottom of the well. After hearing his mysterious words, the queen could not rest, and at last she asked her husband to have the longship prepared once more so that she could go and see her stepdaughter. The king gave the order gladly. Of course he did. The man's an idiot. And it all happened as it happened before. She steered the ship over the sea with her own hands, and when it was approaching the land, it was seen and recognized by Princess Goldtree. The prince was out hunting again. The princess ran in great terror to her friend, the other princess, who was upstairs in her chamber. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? She cried, for I see my father's longship coming, and I know that my cruel stepmother is on board, and she will try to kill me, and she tried to kill me before. Oh, come, let us escape to the hills. Not at all, replied the other princess, throwing her arms around the trembling gold tree. I am not afraid of thy lady stepmother. Come with me, and we will go down to the seashore to greet her. So they both went down to the edge of the water, and when Queen Silvertree saw her stepdaughter coming, she pretended to be very glad, and sprang out of the boat and ran to meet her, and held out a silver goblet full of wine for her to drink. <laughs> I'm sorry I poisoned you before. For no particular reason, have a goblet of wine before we say anything else. <laughs> Tis rare wine from the east, she said, and therefore very precious. I brought a flagon with me, and so that we might pledge each other in a loving cup. Princess Goldtree, who was ever gentle and courteous, would have stretched out her hand for the cup, had not the other princess stepped between her and her stepmother. Nay, madame, she said gravely, looking at the queen straight in the face. It is custom in this land for one who offers a loving cup to drink from it herself first. I will follow the custom gladly, answered the queen, and she raised the goblet to her mouth. But the other princess, who was watching very closely, noticed that she did not allow the wine that it contained to touch her lips. So she stepped forward, and as if by accident, struck the bottom of the goblet with her shoulder. Part of its contents flew into the queen's face, and part, before she could shut her mouth, went down her throat. And so, because of her wickedness, she was, as the good book says, caught in her own net. For she made the wine so poisonous that almost before she had swallowed it, she fell dead at the two princesses' feet. No one was sorry for her, for she really deserved her fate. And they buried her hastily in a lonely piece of ground, and very soon everybody had forgotten all about her. As for Princess Goldtree, she lived happily and peacefully with her husband and her friend for the remainder of her life, and never spoke to her dumbass dad again. <laughs> I like how she was absolutely confident. At like at no point did she waver on the belief that um, her uh, it would be her father in his own longship. Like, that was absurd to her. <laughs> Anyways, yes, you're absolutely right. This is a version of Sleeping Beauty. Oh, Gia says, this trout needs to shut his trap. Yeah, I think we need to make some trout, bake some trout. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is obviously a Scottish version of uh, Sleeping Beauty. It really feels like an earlier version of Sleeping Beauty. Like, Sleeping Beauty is a take on this. Um, yeah, GS, right? <laughs> Um, GS says woman power and I gotta be honest this is not a recently published book this is not a recently published version of it and the thing that stood out to me the most was the ways in which it was not tip the typical condescending portrayal of woman there are definitely elements like there's only so much you can expect in an old fairy tale there's definitely like selling off your daughter basically and things like that but um <clears throat> I think what stands out for me is like at no point do any of the men do anything heroic, nor are they ever right. They don't figure anything out. They don't help anything. <laughs> they do nothing. And uh, it's funny because usually in a fairy tale, it's the men who do the stuff and the women are like, Ooh, which way is up? And why, why wouldn't I just need an apple from a woman who hates me? Um, 
Uh, I, I found it delightfully rich uh, compared to the original version of Sleeping Beauty. I also found it a lot more plausible because, like, Sleeping Beauty has weirdness in it. And I don't just mean, like, the obvious stuff. But there's weirdness, like, this prince finds him and, and, and her and falls in love with her upon sight of her unconscious body. And, like, it, like, it doesn't know anything else about her. Like, there's just so much messiness and weirdness and bizarreness to the tale um, that uh, isn't here. And I, I really I just really enjoy it. Uh, the, obviously, no mirror here, no talking mirror. Instead, it was this weird trout. Okay, well, um, as I said, uh, January and February is a rough month uh, for most people. Uh, and I'll be honest, for myself included, this is a bleak month. And for that reason, my focus this month will be doing more escapist, antidepressant kind of stuff. Cheerful, uplifting things um, as much as I'm able to. And that means in the stories here, but also on Thursday. And I'm kind of thinking, as you know, I, my thoughts can change before that. But for Thursday's stream, I think I might try to write my own story of making myself a Disney princess. So if you want to be a part of that or help me make some decisions or maybe even draw my beautiful face as a Disney princess. Um, well, Thursday at 630 is when we're doing that. Uh, so, um, yeah, make sure you tune in. We write stories live and we generally have a silly time and it's chill and it's fun. Nice music. I think you'll enjoy it if you haven't watched it before. And beyond that, uh, I'm going to be doing some other various types of uh, content through the month outside of our normal Tuesday and Thursday stuff as I am able to. So uh, stick around for that. And for the rest of you, I really appreciate you guys coming by my cabin, hanging out and listening to the stories. I hope you enjoyed the stories. If you liked it, give me a like. If you aren't already, subscribe. That is the thing that really helps me. And I really appreciate you guys coming around and listening to my stories tonight. Take care of yourself, and of course, get a good sleep. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.